The boroughs are New York City. The burbs are everywhere else. Real estate is the ultimate game of risk and reward. It's the biggest investment most people ever make. Fortunes are made over a lifetime and lost in a day. And we're not playing with Monopoly money. How do you stay ahead? Who's buying? Who's selling? And why? What do they know? We want the truth. You need an edge. Burrows and Burbs is your secret weapon, giving you the insider knowledge and strategies you need to succeed in the high-stakes world of real estate. From Palm Beach to Palm Springs, Manhattan to Malibu, we press the experts to expose the pain, find the deals, and occasionally predict the future. That's Burrows and Burbs, Thursdays, 3 o'clock Eastern, noon Pacific. Because everyone can make money in real estate. Welcome, everybody. Welcome. Burrows and Burbs, episode 140. Today, we're talking about senior housing options for seniors. We've got three specialists on the show today. We've got Russell Barksdale from Waveney House, Anthony Gonzalez of Watermark Communities down in Palm Beach, and Graham Willoughby of Commonwealth House in Rhode Island. First, I want to thank my co-host, Roberto Cabrera. How are you doing? Hi, everybody. Good. Very good. Excited. All right. So now, you know, I'm a little out of sequence here, but here we go. There we are, Burrows and Burbs, episode 140. You can find the rest of them on YouTube, and you can find them on Apple Podcasts. I'm your host, John Engel of the Engel Team. That's Roberto Cabrera, Brown Harris Stevens in New York City. There's a little bit about Roberto, his video, his Million Dollar Club Award, and his two current listings. He's got a rental in Manhattan for $7,500 a month and a million five for a one bedroom on West 89th Street. But most importantly, you got to go check out the Roberto Cabrera Report. It's all about the rentals. It's two weeks old, and he uh, analyzes the current rental market in New York City. I want to thank our sponsor, Grace Farms. I pulled up the Nature page because I thought this was kind of interesting. You can go to all of their programs coming up at Grace Farms. They're doing animal encounters with the New Canaan Nature Center, gardening workshops, learning about beekeeping, and nature's classroom. Animal encounters is something I know all about. I encountered a fox on my driveway this week, and then I encountered... A day later, an owl on my property. And with that, I'm going to move right into Waveney. These are just some of the living options at Waveney. Independent living. They worry about uh, and take care of memory, dementia care, skilled nursing, respite care. There's home care options. I'm going to turn it over now to Russell Barksdale. Tell us about Waveney Life Care Network. Thank you, John. Thank you, Roberto, um, and everyone for participating. Uh, Wave Me Life Care Network really is the full continuum on steroids. So uh, we provide uh, everything uh, that um, a geriatric or a senior uh, citizen um, or clientele uh, could want from uh, active retirement to assisted living, to memory care, to home care, to hospice, to navigator, program, at-home programs. Um, we do it We do it all. We employ our own physicians, our nurse practitioners. Uh, we do telemedicine as well. So we really want to be a one-stop for Fairfield County, Southwest Connecticut, uh, into New York and Manhattan. Um, and I'm, I'm happy to be part of the program. And I've participated with John and Roberto and other great topics that they've had in the past. Um, but senior housing, I think, uh, because of the baby boomers, we're starting to see the infiltration not only in our surrounding communities, but more people wanting to uh, stay in their, their hometown, if you will, where their kids and their grandkids are being raised. And, and even in some very affluent communities, uh, that population of over 65 is now uh, reaching 16, 17 percent which is even more than the number of children that are in the school system. So it is going to be a future uh, investment, I think, for, for financiers that are looking for opportunities, multifamily to active adult, to small houses, have Florida homes, whatever 
they want to look at in investing. I think this is a a market that is on the horizon. I think some communities have taken advantage of it and others haven't. And if I look at the outmigration, if you will, for Southwest Connecticut and Manhattan and New York, as I mentioned earlier, uh, Palm Beach uh, seems to be number one and Collier County is is number two and Naples within Collier County is is starting to really, uh, as you know, if you've ever been to uh, West Palm Beach and, and Palm Beach, uh, the pricing now in Naples and Palm Beach is comparable to some of the affluent areas that are in Fairfield County right now. And we're, we used to see people sell their homes and take a great chunk of equity out of their home and be able to put that into something more modest and still have a retirement income. Those prices in these key markets, I think, in these retirement communities have now become uh, pretty pricey. Okay, so a couple things I heard. One is that the old fashioned notion of uh, when I'm done with my house, I move into the home, one transition, that thinking is out the window. You talked about basically several different levels of transition, several different levels of independence. And Waveney Life Care Network is called Waveney Life Care Network because you're attempting to help them on the continuum. Is that right? So That's correct. how would you describe in simple terms the yeah. continuum? Yeah, there's no single point of entry. I mean, back in back in the day, you know, when you know, I'm old enough to remember, you know, you would go into an active adult retirement community, or you'd buy into a continuing care retirement community or a plan community, however, you, however the the label was at that time, and that's where you would age in place. You would go from your active adult retirement community to assisted living, and then, God forbid, you'd have a an acute care episode and required subacute care or long-term care, then you'd move to a skilled level. Now everything is trying to be brought to the home. The resident doesn't feel like they have the equity in the home. They want to keep their home as much as they possibly can. They want to remain independent in their home. So then home care ballooned up and you start to see home care companies and at-home company licensed and certified start producing services to to the home and to the residents so they could remain in their home. Uh, and we're seeing with inflation right now, with the pricing to purchase another home in a different area, you know, with the interest rates being six, seven percent, they're feeling that they would rather hunker down and they're getting pushed out a little bit because of the increases in the real estate taxes, because of the increases in the cost of living into some of these affluent affluent communities. Now we're starting to see them look at what are their tax implications for getting out from under their home and having that nest egg, that retirement fund equity build up so that they can enjoy the next part of their life. So your 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 concept is not a geographical location you go to. This is in home. No, no, we have we have we have both a skilled acute rehab where you could come here and rehab short term and then go home. We have a long-term care where you can stay here for a long-term period of time. We have assisted living where you can stay here and get provided uh, supportive services in your own apartment. Or we can bring all of that to your current residence and we can provide telemedicine license and certified therapy and whatever housekeeping, grocery shopping, whatever, a laundry list of things. Uh, we take care of a thousand patients or clients uh, per day over that full continuum of care. So there's no Roberto. We got we got seven thousand homes in a town like New Canaan. We only have one company in town, Waveney, uh, that is in this business uh, for my whole life. When I turned about thirty-five, I think my mother pulled me aside and said, "You need to get on the list at Waveney." I'm like, "What?" Oh, yeah. Yeah. You better put, get yourself on the list now. I mean, one of these days you're going to get old, John, and you're going to want a spot at Waveney. Make sure that they have a spot for you. So there's always been an anxiety, like when I need a Waveney, you know, is it going to be there for me and can I afford it? 
And so it's really interesting to me that the business plan for Russell and Waveney has evolved to say, we're never going to be able to build the perfect number of, of beds here. We're going to help you in your home. And then we're going to help you, I guess, um, uh, 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 in the, uh, what do you call it, acute we're gonna help you even at the hospital level. So there's gonna be the dementia wing, there's the hospital wing, and then there's the ordinary, what? Um, the the long -term, a long-term care wing is, you know, not that you're bedridden, but you, you know, you're requiring 24 seven care. Our waiting list right now is six and a half years. So we have people that are in their early sixties that have put their name on the waiting list in inevitably that they get to that point uh, in time. But right now we still try to provide as much services and care as we can in an individual's home. But at some point in time, that cost threshold flips over, right? If you think about having a, a full-time aide living with you, a uh, caregiver living with you, at some point in time, that cost is cost prohibitive for for uh, a couple and then they look for for the transition at that point and whether it's you know in Rhode Island um you know with Graham or whether it's with Anthony uh in Palm Beach they're looking for that cost benefit if you will to be able to extend their funds i mean people are living a lot longer than they used to be and you sometimes need to find that safety net, that nonprofit that's going to say, even if you outlive your savings, we're still going to take care of you. And we're not going, you're not going to have to move outside, outside of our network. And that's where the financial implications come and looking at, you know, each of these organizations and um, they're all wonderful. They're all wonderful. But uh, you got to look at, you know, how how long is your your funds, you know, that retirement fund going to last you? Russ, you're in Fairfield County solely. I'm in Fairfield County, correct. But is your company solely functioning in Fairfield County for the most part? No, we have the entire the entire state. Uh, I get short term rehab. I get 13 different hospitals in Manhattan that refer to us for short term uh, acute rehab and. Uh, we'll discharge them back home, but uh, um, geographically, that is our that is our catchment area. Um, and as I had mentioned before, not to to sound like a, uh, we looked at our our out migration, if you will, for that targeted market, and that's when we start seeing the Naples and we start seeing you know Palm Beach and West Palm Beach start showing up on a you know first it started as retirement home. I'm spending six months and one day in Florida, so I get the tax benefit, to I'm going to stay in Florida full time, to now I need help and care. I want to be near where my family is, especially where my daughter is. And therefore, you're seeing that migration coming back into the community. Anthony, I'm going to pull up the geography, you're at Watermark Retirement Communities, and it was interesting to me that you're in many, many states. This is a big company. Um, and then I wanted to click and show, this is the Watermark at West Palm Beach, where you're located. Can you tell us about the Watermark generally and the Watermark at West Palm Beach? And, and I mean, obviously, first off, thank you, uh, John and Roberto. This is a uh, this has been cool. You know, even just talking beforehand on being able to join you guys' uh, podcast is is awesome. So thank you. Um, but yeah, Watermark is is going to be nationally here in the states as well as in China. Um, so we're a pretty big company that started 35 years ago with David Freshwater, David Barnes, who really looked at senior living and said something's missing, right? China so, for the Chinese or China for somebody like me who just wants to go someplace else? Well, if you wanted to go to China, we have a place for you over there too, John. Um, okay. But but really the biggest thing is, you know, uh, reimagining senior living in retirement communities. We have a lot, as I think uh, Russell was mentioning, percentage-wise, Florida is the highest percentage of people over 65 in, in the States at 19 or 20, which has probably gone up uh, as of two minutes ago. Um, beyond that, what we're trying to do here is really create a sense of luxury, but also wellness components for members that we have coming in into our communities. You know, 
quite honestly, our, our clientele, our, our members aren't really looking into their, their savings or depleting that savings. They're coming in here for something other than a place to get to tomorrow. You know, they're coming in to find new purposes, new beginnings, uh, new friendship, new socializations. Um, and that's what we're providing for those members in, in a luxury setting. Um, as you can kind of take a look at my background here, I'm in one of our restaurants that we have for our members here in the in the West Palm Beach area. I think, you know, touching in on this, I, I think it's awesome that I saw that some of you are in New York, some of you are in the, uh, Connecticut. People, the, the five-year net of people moving to Florida that are, you know, over the age of 65 is increasing. Uh, New York is the top at 250,000 uh, over the, the next five years. And Connecticut even rounded into the top 10 of people moving to, to Florida. When they look at what they want to do, you know, beyond purposes of their social security, their tax, their pension isn't going to have a state tax like you guys do up north. Um, it, it's beyond that, right? It's the warmth. It's it's you know finding new new purposes. It's being a little being a little selfish into saying you know what do I want to do you know with the rest of my life, um, and that's what we're providing for our, our members here. So I'm excited to kind of share a little bit more about that and answer some questions and just kind of give some some answers as to what we're doing here at the watermarks. It's it's a lot more than you know. You won't come into my community on a Tuesday and see bingo happening. You know, you'll, you'll come in and see members learning new languages, members, you know, integrated into Watermark University, we, philanthropists into Watermark for Kids, which is our charitable donations. Um, so it's, it's really set in part to what our clientele and what our members have done with their, their amazing lives um, and just kind of adding on to that. So I was, I you see your presence is, is across the country. And I was, I did some, I was just doing some reading prior to this and said the states with the most assisted living communities was California, which I was stunned by, but it's over double the next, which is Washington state. California had 4,100 living, uh, assisted living communities. Washington state was 1902 and Florida was third, which I was stunned by at 1804. Do you guys have, is your presence reflect that or you have that, you have more in California? Our, our presence is really presented by one, the opportunity of that area. It doesn't match where our clientele are, are going to be wanting to be, right? Uh, Naples, Beverly Hills, um, Del Mar. Um, you know, I can't really speak in all honesty to what we're doing as far as California and branching out. What I can tell you is the buildings that the communities that we are building are set specifically for that area. So they're brand new communities that we're building up tailored into, okay, who wants to come to West Palm Beach? The people that want to come to West Palm Beach are one, obviously people that want the warmth in the, the, the area, the, 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 geogra the geographical here, maybe they have some friendships, but also is what does a West Palm Beach look like? They look like a New Yorker that actually still wants to get around you know, get all of the, the city feel without the, the 20 mile walk. Um, that, that's really what we're seeing here. And that's what we're building upon that matching that geographical area to, you know, the members that we're going to see that actually want to be in that area. Um, and then you go by population, right? How many people are in California and that, that, that surrounding area? How many people are in West Palm Beach? We have another community in Miami. Does it make sense for us to have a community in the, in the middle of, of these two communities? It just doesn't right now. Um, it's, it's, you know, small town to small town to small town. And then you get into Miami, Fort Lauderdale, and then the next biggest uh, region is going to be us here at West Palm. So Graham, you're Roberto, in Rhode Island. I can answer, Roberto, I can answer the question as to why there are so many assisted living communities in California, because California is a very popular location for my style of assisted living, which is the care home in California. They have something called a CRFE, a, a, a a care home for the elderly. And these are six to eight to 10 bed homes that are in residential neighborhoods that have been converted into assisted living. So there could be a city with, you know, 10 or 12 large hundred bed plus assisted livings, but 300 um, care homes. For instance, the, you know, uh, Phoenix, Arizona has 3000 in the greater Phoenix area. These are six, 10, 12 bed small homes that are in residential communities. That you don't even know they're there really. But what they provide is that small sort of uh, residential feel, um, feeling like you're living in a home. It's kind of like the Golden Girls, right? Five, ten folks living together as friends, uh, but also with the 24-hour care and amenities that a larger assisted living can provide. So I, I'm glad that you pointed that out because uh, it does help segue into 
my what I rep represent on this phone call. So thank you for doing that. I'm going to pull up your screen. Tell, yeah, tell me about... I just inter interrupt one second to ask answer Roberto's question. When you're looking at assisted living, uh, and I'll jump back out again. Um, some states have a Medicare uh, have a Medicaid moratorium um, for assisted living, meaning that if you're in New Jersey and you need assisted living, then the state will pay even if you don't have the resources. You can get a Medicaid bed in an assisted living because there is it is allowed in New Jersey. Uh, uh, Connecticut does not, as a state, allow Medicaid. Uh, does not pay Medicaid does not pay for assisted living. So everything in Connecticut is private pay. So you have some people that do not have the financial means that are looking for those those pockets, one being uh, Pennsylvania, the other being New Jersey, where they have that that safety net with Medicaid uh, that would provide assisted living services. Boy, this is this is a this is exactly where I wanted to go. So, are people moving to senior friendly states? You're suggesting New Jersey and Pennsylvania, where they have more options, more 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 of the less expensive options. A hundred a hundred percent. So, you can have a for profit entity that owns an assisted living business, and that person runs out of money, and that for profit can bill Medicaid. For, for that bed and for that unit. So you'll see more development in those areas that they can take care of that modest income population where other states, because it's private pay, in order to make that financial number and their performance work, have to go after the more affluent, affluent community. And is Rhode Island one of those states? Rhode Island does, uh, does has no moratorium. Uh, Rhode Island isn't a Medicaid waiver state, so we do, we are able to uh, apply through the state for Medicaid beds. And the actual one of the things that sort of held back that side of the business is the the reimbursement rate has been so low for so long. Uh, but you see that in the news now; everybody's screaming about it because nursing homes are shutting down because they can't afford, you know, the the ones who take care of uh, of you know folks that don't have as many resources. They just simply can't afford to pay their staff, pay their uh, their expenses. And it's a real, you know, it's actually, you know, honestly a tragedy. But the certain states have turned things around. Rhode Island actually doubled its Medicaid reimbursement rate uh, two years ago, and it's at about to add 10% more. So I, I do have a couple of Medicaid beds. I reserve those for folks who, you know, because what you need to do is uh, spend down your assets till you have none. Uh, and then you can... Uh, apply for those for those beds. So I leave those as an option for my residents that, you know, that's a that's a, a possibility. Um, they're healthy. They're going to live a long time. They don't want to move again. Um, we like them. They like us. You know, it's a small place. It's a personal place. So we like to have, you know, the residents that we like to have around, we want to keep them around. And so we give them that option. That's a good segue to actually showing your website. It's called CommonwealthHouseRI.com. Well, that's that's the house ri and there's the website how yeah. how big is the facility so it's a it's a care home so this was actually a house that we bought my wife and i so the back story is um we're actually from marin county california uh also a very affluent area um but like i said in california they have lots of these small care homes in uh their communities uh, my grandfather stayed in one and there's me about 20 pounds lighter and uh, <laughs> And, um, you know, when I, we, we moved out to the East coast for work, I got a job at Brown university and, um, my wife and I were sort of looking for things to invest in and be a part of something that we could do for the community. And we noticed that there wasn't anything like this in Rhode Island. And so we started looking around, we learned a lot about the business. Um, and we found a, a really great place to build. It's in a city called Warwick, which is right outside of Providence, it's right by 95, uh, a really easy uh, spot to access close to hospitals, close to shopping. Uh, close to Newport and Boston folks pass through a lot. Connecticut po folks pass through when they're on their way to their Rhode Island homes. And uh, we bought it. We converted it from a, a five bedroom, three bath home into an eight bedroom, five bath home. And so now it has eight bedrooms, five baths. Uh, I'm licensed for 10 beds. Uh, we've been full since 2022. And um, so we're able to provide all of the active, uh, all of the um, 
assistance with the activities of daily living that assisted living is able to do. You can see I'm wearing my mask there. That was back in those days. Um, but you get a pretty good idea. This is, you know, this is meant to feel like a home. When you're coming in, you're uh, you're meeting somebody uh, in their home in a uh, in a uh, high and sort of affluent type of a of a of a residence, but also something that feels familiar, something that feels like like they're still living at home, but with 24 hour care. Uh, all of our uh, caregivers are licensed CNAs, CMTs, LPNs. Uh, we have an RN that's on staff taking care of staff. That was our chef. Actually, we have a private chef that prepares all the meals in the residential kitchen. There's me again um, for our uh, residents, and you know, a beautiful place that folks can come in and feel comfortable and at home. Um, and, uh, you know, and something that's familiar and, and it also it's, you know, my wife and I own it. We're the owners, uh, it's our pride and joy. And so, uh, we'd like to think that that pride of ownership is a part of what we are able to provide to the, that whole equation. So uh, we're really proud of what we do. Wow. So quite a range so far. Russell works just Connecticut. Anthony is part of a national international uh with places in many different states and your um own private 10 beds yep we're actually expanding into memory care so we bought the property next door we're opening a brand new uh uh build from the ground up 14 bedroom 16 bed dedicated memory care cottage so if you think of a you know a large house it's going to be about 8700 square feet uh each room is its own private room, private bath, uh, spacious, really nice, super high end. We're going for the fully high end, very, uh, very luxury type of experience, big common areas, big backyard, but still in a residential neighborhood, very residential feeling has a garage, you know, a driveway. You really wouldn't be able to tell that it's a, it's a, it's a assisted living community when you drive up. And that's sort of the point. How's the memory care? Uh, like what's the demand difference from your perspective? So the, we've done market studies. Assisted living is one of those standard assisted living is is folks who uh, don't have dementia. You know, they're they they may have lower level dementia, but they're not going to elope, meaning they're not going to walk out the door and walk down the street. Uh, they have generally good mobility, so they're able to get up out of a chair, out of a bed on their own. That's sort of standard level assisted living for us in, in our market. Memory care are folks that you know are unaware of person in place. They have trouble um, taking care of themselves. They may be a danger to themselves or they have a uh, risk of elopement. That segment is really in high demand right now. The, um, the standard assisted living model, pretty much in Rhode Island, every bed or every person that needs that, there's a bed for them. Memory care, right now, if I built 10, you know, 16 bed uh, assisted livings with memory care uh, uh, options, it wouldn't satisfy the, the demand that's out there. Those are, that's something that's really very much in need. Assisted living is more of a want, you know, to describe the, uh, the amenities and the really cool stuff that, uh, that, uh, that Anthony and Russell described for their communities. But memory care is something where a person really can't live on their own in their own home anymore, and they really need an extra level of uh, of safety and of care and of attention. And that's uh, you know that's a really uh, a very much a growing market right now. But it's also more expensive to run that, right? It is more staff, uh, more training. Uh, you know, it's double the staff. You have to have in Rhode Island at least. You have a full time R R R N on all the time. Um, you know, the rates are definitely considerably more. Um, here in the Rhode Island market, I mean, if you see that Genworth uh, cost of care, I mean, in Rhode Island, it's it's pretty inexpensive, to be perfectly honest, at $8,500 to $9,000 a month. That's in, it's inexpensive. You're talking Southern Connecticut or Boston area, that's a $13,000 a month type of a, a situation. So um, so that's kind of what you're looking for in these, you know, that's getting close to, uh, to nursing home level prices. And Roberto, you have three different types of building codes as well. So if you're if you're looking at active adult, that's one building code. If you're looking at assisted living, that's another. Memory yep. care is a third. And then when you get into skilled level, I mean, you're at the hospital level, uh, having to do with you know egress, um, suppression, fire suppression systems, things of that nature. So the cost of construction also yep. you know, ramps up considerably. 
I've got on the screen the Genworth mm. survey, and it, it's scaring me. It says that the cost of a semi-private room is fifteen thousand dollars a month, and it's heading up uh, to twenty. Uh, private room sixteen a month, and going to twenty-two. Um, semi-private. I don't know any of my friends who can afford that. And semi-private is code for you're sharing it with somebody else. So right. think about private. <laughs> you know, like that's 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 actually probably a low number for a private room. Look, John, you even have, um, and I'm sure this is true. Well, I know it's true for New York, and I know it's true for Connecticut. You still have old school nursing facilities that have quads that have four beds in a room. So um, you really have to do your homework when you move into a facility and your your finances start to wane um, of of what the living arrangements are going to be later in life. Something well, to know about moving, the pricing. Who's moving in? I wanted to get into the the the, the timing of all this because you keep talking about sixty five years old, but most of the sixty five year olds I know are saying, "No, no, no, we're not talking about me. We're talking about old people." And um, and then when I talk to my eighty five year old friends, they're like, "No, no, not me. We're talking about old older people." Uh, you know, maybe when I'm 90, I've got I've got clients who are in their 90s uh, living um, happily as a couple in their New York apartment saying, yeah, one of these days I might need I might need to move into the home, but not until it's absolutely necessary. So talk to me about when do people make the decision and how do they come to that decision to give up independent living? Look, I'll, I'll start and be brief so that Anthony and Graham has has plenty of time. Uh, the first is usually an acute care episode. OK, um, the second is that you have a spouse that uh, gets in the car and gets lost and can't find their way back home. Um, there is something that happens and that occurs that the spouse and the family indicate, OK, mom or dad, uh, we need to we need to look at alternatives for you. Um, a lot has to do with do they have support around them, and that social support could be their church, it could be their daughter. Uh, but now you're having so many multi generations that a 90 year old has a 70 year old, and we have mother and daughters sometimes move in together um, into an active adult because that's their social network and they support. They support each other. So I would say, you know, plan ahead, um, meet with your tax advisor and know exactly what your positions are. But we find too many times it is that acute care episode. It is that crisis. It is that, you know, um, the wife wakes up in the middle of the night and calls 911 because she sees someone in her house or she sees someone outside or they get in the car and drive, and now they're trying to track her down using her phone, there is something that snaps um, and causes that family to say, we have a crisis situation, we have to make the decision, and that's not the best time to make a decision, right? So we promote always start having a little bit of support at home for you. You know, you have a spouse that's having difficulties, I mean, I think about our navigator program that's made specifically for the caregiver so the spouse can get out and still have a life and still feel supported. Mm -hmm. uh, but at some point in time, that 75 year old gentleman can't lift his wife off the floor if she falls or has a. So it is that point in time that people find themselves in a crisis. And too often, that's when we get the that's when we get the call, and, and I'll, I'll leave it up to Anthony. Uh, Anthony, I'm sure with you know with retirement active adult, they're just wanting to downsize. And we have a lot of people in town that want to do that, but where they want to stay in town, and we really don't have an active adult retirement community in the area. So I'll turn it back over to them. And perfect in a in our assisted living, in our memory care environments, which we have all three levels, independent living, assisted living, and memory care. Um, really, the, the biggest thing for you know our clientele, our members, is being able to kind of make their own decisions before someone's making the decisions for them. Um, and I think 
between what we offer at Watermark and what what Graham offers over in um, Connecticut, Rhode Island. I apologize. Uh, is 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 going to be very different, but also the the same nature, just different, just different clientele, different members in a different lifestyle. Um, for for an example, their life. Mm -hmm. For an example, you know, I have I had a, a member that just moved in a month ago, and her and her husband lived in a townhome just up uh, just up the road from us, and very independent, very comfortable. But the stairs are just getting a little too much for them, right? It's just it's just becoming a little too much. She told me the other morning, and I this is a true story. Of her 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 words uh, to me exactly was she felt very guilty in the mornings because of how happy she is she made this decision. She has she went from having a, a planner of one one item on her calendar for the week to now she's too busy to take phone calls because she's just going from one one class from water aerobics ran a little late today. Now she's getting, you know, having to rush into a, a nice lunch or anything of that nature. But that's what we want to have. And that's the clientele that's coming into our community. I have members that are 62 years old that come in here and are enjoying that independent lifestyle. You know, they still get around with their friends. They maybe very rarely see them, but they're enjoying it. They have the option and they have that security that even if they don't have family here, they know, hey, Watermark, if we ever need to get to a point where we need extra assistance, we can do that here and we don't have to leave our home. Uh, so that's going to be important for us. The, you know, the other thing uh, on top of that is quite honestly, you know, our, our, our members that are moving in, they want that socialization. They, our biggest competition, quite honestly, is home because they can afford to have a private caregiver and their home 24 seven with them, which is upwards of 15 to $25,000 here a month um, for just one person. So, you know, we have members that come in here and it's really, yeah, they, we can do the care for them. We can help get them to where they need to be and, and all of that nature and provide a very luxurious environment for them. But for them, they, they want to make new friends. Life hasn't stopped. You know, they're not, they're not living till tomorrow. They're, you know, they're, they're doing new things. Like I mentioned, they're learning new languages. Um, it's, it's really inspiring for them and for, for us. Um, so that's, that's really what we're providing here at, as far as the community essence goes. I just do want to mention when we were looking at the slides of you know the nursing facilities going up to fifteen thousand, twenty thousand dollars per per room. If you're private paying for a skilled nursing environment, yeah, you're going to be paying that right now. Um, but the nursing environment is a very skilled need. There, that's going to be a, someone that cannot get out of bed. You know, that is you know in that later stage of their their life or their disease course that got them to that point. Um, assisted living, memory care. We don't service that same clientele to that extent. We're, it's, it's, uh, it's against our state licensing. So you have the standard license, a little bit of a limited nursing service license that you can utilize here. And then you have your full-blown nursing facility. And as you kind of drop into those tiers, you'll notice a lot of changes, most of them being care-wise, you know, who we're hiring, what does the day look like in here? Um, but for us, our members, not really focusing on that. They're just more focusing on themselves and where they want to be making sure they have someone that can care for them, but that they still have things going on that purpose them. And I'll just, can I just throw in the skilled nursing part of it? A lot of that is, is temporary rehab. Yeah. So, um, you know, a, a skilled nursing facility, let's say you go to the hospital and you had, you had a fall or an acute incident and you need rehab, um, Medicaid or Medicare will pay for three weeks worth of care, but the assisted living is going to bill $400 a day plus for that. So that does go into that number. That number is not a long-term number. That, that number is a three-week number. They pay for 21 days, and then they start telling you, you got to find a place to go. So that's where they, you know, we get those phone calls. So John, to answer your question of where a lot of these folks are coming from, that's they're coming from the nursing home. They say, I don't want to pay $450 a day anymore. Can you, you know, can we move to your place so that my, uh, my mom can, you know, have a, a more doable, sustainable uh, environment where she can also rehab because you continue having rehab come in, Medicare pays for that folks to show up and do PT and OT and things like that. So that is a, a definitely a, a uh, sort of a stream of, of residents, the, the very common phone call that I get, mom's in a rehab, she needs to get out now, I don't want to pay 450 a day anymore, help me. Um, another, you know, stream of residents that we get is folks who call and they say, well, mom is living at home, you know, she's perfectly happy, perfectly capable, but, it, but it's just lonely. Or maybe her spouse has passed away, she's there by herself. I come in and I visit her before and after work, but I have to work, I have to take the kids. 
you know, I have a life too. And she just, she sits there and she doesn't, she didn't used to be that way, but she's alone all the time now. And she, you know, it's affecting her. It's affecting her, you know, her mental state. She's just not as happy anymore. She forget, forgets things. I think she might have dementia. I don't know. We just need to get her into a place where she's going to have that social stimulation again, because, you know, uh, at, I'm sure you've read all the studies where loneliness is just as deadly as smoking for someone who's elderly. They, it really takes a toll on your health. And so a lot of times it's just a matter of getting somebody into a place where they can socialize again. And, you know, my residents, they like the small sort of the small house model uh, because it's not, you know, it's not huge. It's not intimidating. It's um, for some folks, you know, they would just lock themselves in their room if they were in a big, you know, a big place with lots going on. And you don't want them to do that. My residents, I can see their door and I just tell them to leave it open. And eventually they hear things are going on. We're, we're playing games or cooking. They can smell the food from the kitchen come in. And they come out and they start to interact. And before you know it, they've become part, you know, their their personalities back. They become a part of the community again. They talk and they interact with people. And, you know, that's a really cool thing to see because a lot of times folks come in and they're, you know, they're it's hard to it's hard to get them to open up. And after a little while, they get better. And you don't think about that. It's like, am I gonna go to assisting living and get better? And it's like, yeah, they do, you do because how often is this coming from the kids who say, I think my parents need this? Or how often is it coming from the, the patient themselves who say, my spouse just died and yeah. I'm lonely and I'm ready for a change? A how, often, how often does it happen to uh, coincide with when they stop driving? Because it occurs to me that for a great many Americans who are able to drive and then one day they can't, does that cause them to start thinking about an alternate alternative living arrangement? Yeah. maybe it's time to move if i can't drive absolutely all of the above you know the kid the a lot of times when the kids call me they say graham you know mom doesn't want to leave uh but can she just can we just come in and have lunch you know just so she can see what this is like and a lot of times that you know that that uh that gets them thinking hey this isn't so bad after all um a lot of times like you said the spouse dies um the spouse passes i'm sorry and um and I get a phone call and say, you know, this just isn't home anymore. I don't, I don't feel right here without my spouse. You know, what, what can, what do you have? What, and what can you offer me uh, to, to make my life a little more stimulating these days? And, um, you know, so all of the above, John. I definitely get uh, a good mix of the, the two. You know, uh, my independent living members are going to be searching for themselves, uh, just searching for ideas, things that they can look for in that nature. But I also have a, a lot of the adult children that come into our community. And the first thing they say is this is not at all what my my mom is, is going to be thinking. You know, I have a lot of members that come in. It's my favorite tour to do when someone calls me and they're like, well, you know, mom's not going to want to do anything. Mom's not going to like this. She's been in a nursing home. Her grandma was in a nursing home. Her mom was in a nursing home. It's not going to work. And then they come in and they're like, this is not at all what we were expecting. Um, and that's the overall, you know, process of what we're trying to change uh, is that mindset, that mantra. But as soon as someone takes a, a step in here, I mean, I have adult children leaving in here trying to get applications. Um, so it's it's just one of those things. And I think it's the same thing for for, for Graham over there. Um, you know, when you're when you're thinking about nursing home, you're thinking about all of the the usual suspects. You know, uh, abuse, all of that, no care, no one's there, the food's horrible, you name it. Um, and that's just not what assisted living and memory care is, whether you're at, you know, our level of what we're doing for luxurious wise or you're a smaller personal care home. It's just not the same thing anymore. So I think a lot of people are getting caught by surprise when they go in and actually go through with a tour and they notice, oh, my gosh, this is this is so much easier. And they don't have to pretend that everything's OK while they're by themselves at home. Your your adult children come to visit you and you're like, oh, my gosh, mom's, you know, hiding uh, food in the, the dresser. Um, it's just one of those things. So it just makes it a little bit easier for them as, as they're coming into tour, you're not, you're not getting shocked by, oh my God, this is a horrible hospital type environment. This is really home. This is a place where you can find new, new beginnings. Can we talk about the economics of your industry, the economics, because the. Yeah, Roberto, one of the, one of the things I wanted to build upon was kind of what Anthony was going, which leads into the economics piece of it is, you know, we take our area, we take Manhattan, we take Southwest um, Connecticut, you know, a lot of people have 
hundreds of thousands of dollars of equity into their house and reverse mortgages used to become, you know, became very popular that they could stay where they're at and try to get access to some of that equity. I, my mother was one of 10 kids and my grandfather was one of 14. And so when you looked at that population, you had, you know, 40% of them that says, I built this house, this house is paid for, I don't owe a dime, I'm dying in this house, okay? I don't care what happens. And it sometimes takes that child, that adult child, to show them an active adult retirement community or to show them that they can come out and still live a life and then show them the equity that they can take out of their home. And I think when you look at our region anyway, why there's not as much inventory is you have some people, and I know think, people think it's, you know, it's the interest rate being at six and seven percent. You have some people that are just sitting there going, I have no other option that looks viable to me where I can get out of my house and access that money and that and that equity and downsizing. So we're seeing our own selves for, and we have yeah. probably 20% of our business in, in home care is in an assisted living, right? In assisted living, we want them to age in place and we're augmenting the assisted living by providing home care uh, services to them that are covered by Medicare. So the economics really drive this for us, Roberto, when we're looking at it, and it's, you know, these rates seem very, very high, um, but the amount of equity that some seniors have built into their home is substantial, and we're trying to help assist them from a tax standpoint uh, of how to access that equity and really for them to enjoy their life. What about the industry as a whole? The industry has got to be exploding in the sense that uh, here the numbers of people age 65 in 2022 was 58 million. By 2050, it's going to go up by 47%. So there's an industry that's just going to expand. It's growing at 6.5% per year between 2023 and 2032. And I saw somewhere where the profit margin in, for the industry is 35%. So there's a lot of money in the industry running the entire spectrum from between all of you guys, you guys are literally running the spectrum of what you provide and at what different levels. What will happen? I mean, there's obviously a lot of space for competitors to come in. Like Russ, you're the, you seemingly are the only game in town in Fairfield County. Are you expecting competition to come? Well, no, I mean, we're out there trying to buy up as much land as we possibly can. I mean, the economics for us at a million dollars an acre, you know, changes dramatically. And I think that's why you're seeing some of these secondary markets develop in, in New Jersey and in developing in Pennsylvania and, and possibly in Rhode Island, where you can go in and you have neighbors that don't say not in my backyard, or you have churches that say not in my backyard, bring, bring the seniors here. We would love to have them here. It is an economic multiplier for us because it's bringing in federal dollars into a local economy. But the price of land that we have right now, if you look around Fairfield County, it is so expensive and then if you do want to develop it, you will have, you know, everyone has three attorneys on speed dial. They'll have somebody that is, you talk about 830G, they'll be trying to block you from having that many people in a, in a location. And with the price of land being what it is, you have to have certain in an economy in order to make it affordable for, for the value. Can you, but can, when you're buying land and because the populace doesn't necessarily need to be like, it doesn't have to be so urban in the sense like they need to be convenient because they're not traveling that much, right? Can no, they're traveling further I mean, out? We're yeah, our active adults, cheaper. our active adults will travel and, you know, go on, you know, um, uh, trips to Europe with their friends, you know, their new friends, so four or five of them, you know, we were referring to the golden girls. I mean, they'll get together and, that, you know, their husbands, they're happy, happy widows. So they'll go out and, and, and go on a, on a trip and travel. They do not, from the people that I talk to, they do not want to be put out to pasture. 
they do not want to be in a farmland somewhere where there is nothing to do, that they have no restaurants nearby, they have no shows to go to, no activities. They want to be near areas so that their children can easily access them or pick them up when they're going grocery shopping or pick them up when they're going to the movie. They don't want to be so far out of town that it is a burden on them to come to come and see them. It's a real concern, you know. It, it uh, it's as you say, not everybody is going to welcome a retirement home or a retirement community in their neighborhood. I'd like to hear what Graham's experience has been in Rhode Island uh, doing this. As as have you experienced the same kind of thing in Rhode Island? Well, so when we built our when we started exploring uh, building a care home in Rhode Island, we approached the first thing we did was approach all the neighbors and uh, get a sense of, of, you know, how they would feel about it. And the thing about, you know, the care home is the concerns were, you know, there's going to be a, a lot of noise. There's going to be parking issues. Our residents don't really drive and we end up with uh, an immaculately cared for property and they don't have giant parties either. So um, very quickly, everybody's uh, sort of, you know, concerns were assuaged. In fact, um, we had to go through the zoning process in order to get a permit to do what we wanted to do in this house. Cause it was, you know, 10 people living in one house. There's a special use permit that goes with that. Uh, when we ended up buying the property next door and applying for a 16 bed, all the people that opposed us originally came to the, uh, city planning hearing and, and said how great we were. They were, they were supporters by the, by the next round. And so they saw that. It was a really good thing for their community. It, it, it you know, created this residence that uh, was, you know, beautiful, well-maintained, quiet, great neighbors. We would bring people, you know, we bring, bring people in for sort of neighborly events. We, you know, we have barbecues and stuff. They come over for 4th of July. I would have residents that instead of having Thanksgiving at their house, or the families having Thanksgiving at their house, they just came to our house because we did all the dishes, right? So, um, so we've had a really great experience uh, with, you know, creating these small care homes in neighborhoods. I understand it's, it's, you know, it's tricky and it doesn't always go that way. But I think that, you know, the, uh, the experience that we've had has been really positive. You had um, to sell the neighbors and you had to sell the town on a zoning change? Correct, because they, they'd never heard of this before. There's some municipalities across the country, especially in the Southwest, where this is actually, you're able to do this by right, as long as you stay within a certain number of beds, like in you know Phoenix or anywhere in California, you can do eight or 10 beds. And you don't have to ask anybody anybody's permission. You have to follow a few rules, do a few safety modifications, but nobody will ever know that you're there. Here on the on the East Coast, they don't have that built into the into the zoning regulations. They don't have they've never seen this model of care before. So it did take a little bit of education and you know working with the city. Fortunately, they were you know they were very uh, amenable and they wanted to see these new options show up as a as a you know something they could provide seniors for their residents. Like we talk about the spectrum um, that exists out there. You know you can't it can't just be one thing and. You want to have many options for for seniors, home care, you know, community residences and assisted living, all of that. Uh, you want to be able to provide that as much as possible, especially because of this silver tsunami we talk about coming along. There's going to be uh, we're 20 years out from the peak. There's 10,000 people turn 65 every day, so they deserve those options. Roberto, I, I see the question in the in the in the chat. Where can I get information to provide housing for the elderly in Brooklyn? I think the question is generally for New Yorkers. Number one, most New Yorkers rent, so they don't have all that pile of equity that Russell was talking about earlier to tap into. The second thing is there's um the perception is that if I'm in an apartment in a building, that I'm already in a community and I can walk everywhere, don't need a car. How is it different in New York? That's the question, Roberto. And what you know, that, that's what's a really the good answer. Point. It's a really good point. We have a lot of people who they're finished with their homes in other parts of the country. They move to New York to age because they feel it's easy to get a taxi. It's easy to get, you know, especially if you're in a, in a doorman building or if you're in a building that has no stairs whatsoever. And like, even some doorman buildings have still have some stairs and some obstacles to to manage. But 
a lot of people come here in order to age actually in some ways, but they did just build a brand new building at 85th street, actually uh, 84th street and um, Broadway. It's called the Apsley, just beautiful building. And it's something like 17 or $18,000 for a studio um, per month. And if you get a two bedroom, it's up to like in the thirties per month. Uh, it's an extraordinary facility. I mean, the fact is, it, I think with anything, Manhattan's expensive. New York is expensive. So, um, but I can't imagine it's much different from Palm Beach, to be honest. Yep. And I mean, we do have a, a watermark in Brooklyn Heights as well, um, over in New York. So, I mean, we we try to get into those markets. I mean, as far as us, when we're building anything, we we do we build it to you know, the location again. So we don't have a lot of those issues. West Palm Beach has been growing, you know, ever since it became West Palm Beach. <laughs> I mean, there's, there's something new every, every year, every year here, and you just kind of expect it. But to have options, I think someone mentioned this, to have options for, for seniors, as we have so many coming in, especially in Florida, who has the most coming in percentage-wise, um, it, it's business as usual. Where's the future of this going, Russ? I mean, you know, take we got five more minutes to go. I'd like to hear about the future from all of you. A, yeah, what should I, think... I be doing to prepare for the future? And where are you changing your business model? If you can't build dense housing structures, how are you evolving your business in order to meet the need? I look, I you know, New Cane in Fairfield County is no different than any than any other region. In Florida, you know, it's going. Some communities are going to open their arms and say, "Yes, we want to be supportive of it." Others are not, and so that it is no different. You know, I don't want to, you know, the users to think that you know one community is blocking and other community is accepting. Each community is different. I think Watermark certainly has found that when it's developed throughout the country. So it really, for me, and looking at this region or looking at a heavily densely, uh, density population in certain pockets of Florida, it really takes a partnership. It really takes a partnership with the town in terms of zoning. It takes a partnership uh, with the community to say, this is where we would like senior housing to be, and this is where we're willing to support you in doing that. So. Uh, you're always going to have, regardless of which, and I've practiced in, you know, three or four states, you're always going to have neighbors concerned. Concerned, is there an ambulance going to be driving by? What's the delivery, food delivery going to be? All of those things and concerns, it really takes a community approach to look at it and say, this but is Isn't the want. growth going to be home health aids and your ability to just organize the services? And it doesn't really always have to take place in the home. And I would imagine Anthony and Graham are both going to, like you, expand your services to where the people uh, already are. Well, the point that I, that I was making before is there's already a shortage of nurses. So that one nurse can take care of four people or that one nurse can take care of one person, right? So you're gonna need economies of scale at some point in time. There's not enough nurses staff out there to allow everyone to be able to stay home and independent. That's so okay. there is a cost threshold that's going to be met and it's going to be exceeded where it's going to be more cost effective to be in a congregate setting than it is to remain isolated. And we've already shown Anthony's given, Graham's given great stories, you know, medication monitoring to medication compliance, to eating a balanced meal, to uh, substance abuse, alcohol use goes way up when you're home isolated, you're controlling your bills. You know, there's a lot of reasons to be in a congregate supportive setting than to be home alone. So we'll continue to provide that and we've seen a huge growth, but at some point in time, the manpower, the nurse power that it takes for that one-on-one -on -one care, there's just not enough caregivers to provide it. And that, that, seg that also goes in line with that location. You talked about residences that are out in the countryside or whatever, you can't staff those. Nobody, they won't drive out when they can get a job just down the street. Those are really hard to staff. And that becomes a huge issue when you're outside of town. 
So most likely you'll build a second home and a third home um, because that's the economies of scale. You're not going to be sending nurses out into the countryside. I'm, I've seen it a million times. Someone buys, you know, a piece of property out in the woods because it's so beautiful. And the, all the, the whole time they're hiring, you know, agency people and paying three times as much because no one will show up to work. So you want to stay where the staff is too. You have to keep that in mind. All right, Anthony, what's the big prediction? I, I couldn't uh, agree more with everybody. I think the future for, in a personal sense, right? I think uh, even though you look like you're 25, uh, long-term care insurance is, is going to be a little too pricey than, than it would actually benefit you. Um, so I think it's in research. You know, I have members that come in or prospects that come in that are 50, and they, they're just honestly coming in here to understand what the model is. Um, I think Watermark's done an amazing job of, you know, perfecting the system over 35 years. And, you know, David Barnes himself, who's our, our president and CEO, will say it's not really the system, it's how we apply it to Graham's point as to where we're looking, what we're doing. Um, we're, we're nothing if we don't provide the services that, you know, I've just kind of briefly explained here. But the future is due diligence. You know, um, long-term care insurance isn't what it used to be. At that point, you might as well just take half of what it is. I tried to do it at 28 years old, and it's a $1,500 monthly payment to cover five years if you ever need it. doesn't make sense. Put half of that in a mutual fund and call it a day. Um, the, the future is, you know, at least in the next 20 years, it's just more growth. Um, we're going to have more buildings. I'm building three more communities in Florida alone. Um, so it, it, it's definitely going to be growing. We just got to do it in a way that um, makes sense. And it applies to our, our, you know, our policies and what we envision as a, as, as a company. I love it. Anthony's crystal ball has everybody move into West Palm Beach. <laughs> 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 and he's and he's ready for them. <laughs> sure. And then when they move back to the Northeast, they come to Rhode Island. <laughs> Where there's seasons and apple picking. Oh, I know, I know. Apple, right. And lobster. And lobster. But there is there is no one solution as I think we're all getting to. Um and uh, each region is different. Yep. Um but in order to take, you know, we know how much money we spend on the school system. Imagine that that population of seniors now far exceed the number of kids that are in school. The economics and the dynamics of development and building and structure and infrastructure and support staff and all of that is going to change dramatically. And I think those investors, those developers that find a way to work through the, 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 the passionate people that are saying, not in my backyard, or we don't need it, to looking at this silver tsunami that's hitting our area, that's really where the balance is going to be. And you have passionate people on both sides of the aisle. Do you think that the nation is going to move toward the Pennsylvania, Rhode Island, California model of, of smaller homes in every neighborhood, or is it going to stick with the we're, right, we're seeing, Connecticut We're model? seeing it now. I mean, if you look at the population over the age of 65, Pennsylvania is probably in the top three now, not because of you know the population, but people are finding more cost-effective to live we have we all have here friends who whose parents moved into you know buy in ccrc models in in pennsylvania just because the you know the cost and the price of land and and a dollar goes much further that used to be true for florida right it used to be true for naples it used to be true for west palm beach but those those costs as you saw or are really coming in line in parity to what we're seeing in the Northeast. All right. Well, thank you. I want to express my sincere mm -hmm. gratitude to our fantastic guests and my co-host Roberto today. Thank this you guys really so much. Show. That was really great. Thank you. Really if you great love information. everything about real estate like we do, tell all your friends, spread the word, send a link. Russell by himself, if he just tells his friends, I'm sure our <laughs> traffic will double. Here at Burroughs and Burroughs. So, Russell, spread the word. So, what is that, 20? Yeah. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you just for kidding. tuning in. I can't wait to have everybody back here next week 
for episode 141, where we talk about 3D printed homes. Maybe oh. that's a solution for the elderly. I don't know. Tune in. Let's find out. our next one. <laughs> See you guys. Thanks so much. Thank Cheers. You all, Thanks, everybody. Bye.